Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at Trinity. We'd like to welcome you. If you have any questions, please join us at OurTrinity.org. Or you can also visit us on Facebook at Trinity Church of Wheat Ridge or even on Instagram at Trinity Church CO. We are so glad that you have joined us today. Today, we would like to honor those who have sacrificed their lives for our country and those that are still serving. God bless you on this Memorial Day. Oh, man. 
Once again, we want to welcome you to our services this morning. You know, throughout our lives, we can face disastrous consequences. We certainly, because of COVID-19, are facing that as a nation. Many people have lost loved ones. Many people have been in isolation. We certainly are hurting our economy. We're facing disastrous consequences. But I want to put something else out to you. What would happen if the resurrection had never happened? What would have been the consequences of no resurrection? We're going to find out that in just a few minutes as we get into our study of the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But there was a battle that was called the Battle of Waterloo, and it pitted England and France against one another. England was going to be uh, represented by Wellington, and France was going to be represented by Napoleon. And the outcome of that battle was going to have tremendous consequences, especially for, for England. And so they were quite anxious about what the outcome of that battle would be. Well, they didn't have uh, telegraphs, they didn't have uh, Instagram, they didn't have any of these messages that we have today. They didn't even have uh, a telegram or a telegraph that can send a message of how the battle was going. So England devised a plan, and that plan was that they were going to have a ship sail close to the harbor where Winchester Cathedral was, and there would be a man in the tower, and the ship would signal that man, and then that man would signal the ma next man in the next town or the next hamlet, uh, or the next high place until the word got out and all of England would know the result of that battle. Well, the battle had started and everyone knew the battle was going on, but they had not heard anything. But soon the ship appeared and it appeared there in the harbor and it sent a message. And the first word of that message was Wellington. And that message went out throughout all of England, Wellington. And then the next message was defeated. Wellington defeated, and the fog settled in, and no one knew what the rest of that message was. All they knew was that Wellington had been defeated, and they had disastrous consequences upon their nation. They knew they were coming. But then the fog lifted, and as the fog lifted, the ship sent out the rest of its message. The enemy. In other words, Wellington had defeated the enemy. And yet they had thought it was going to be disastrous consequences. And as I thought about that, I thought about the resurrection. What if Jesus Christ had remained in the grave? That would have been defeat, not only for him, and, but also for us. But the fog lifted, and there was a resurrection. And because of the resurrection, then we can have hope and not face the disastrous consequences of no resurrection. And in this passage of Scripture today, Paul uses two arguments to be able to affirm the reality of the resurrection. First of all, because Christ was raised, then resurrection from the dead is possible. Obviously, if Christ raised, then there can be a resurrection. Second, unless man can be resurrected, then Jesus Christ cannot be resurrected. So Christ's resurrection and man's resurrection stand or fall together. There cannot be one without the other. And not only is a resurrection possible, it is also essential. So the resurrection is going to be showing to us that it is something that's possible in verse 12. But if it is not possible, if it is not essential, then it has seven disastrous consequences in verses 13 through 15. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. 1 Corinthians 15, let's start with verse 12. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep or have died in Christ, they've perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most to be pitied. Let's bow together. 
Father, once again, we are grateful that we can come to this passage of Scripture. And this particular chapter is the greatest evidence given in the entire Bible for the resurrection. And there are disastrous consequences if there is no resurrection. But there are wonderful consequences if there is. So Lord, we would ask as you bring us to this passage of Scripture today, that we might see the tremendous benefit of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that we might be assured not only of His resurrection, but the hope of our own resurrection. So, Father, in all our ways throughout the message today, we'd ask that you direct our path and that we would understand what your will is for our lives and that we would live, even in this time, as people of hope and belief in the resurrection and in our own resurrection, that to be absent from the body would indeed mean to be present with the Lord. So we ask your blessing upon this message. We ask that you be the teacher through the Holy Spirit and your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first argument that Paul's going to give to us here is very simple and it's very logical and is found in verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, then how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? See, the the construction of this question implies a condition that is true. If Christ is raised, then there must be a resurrection. And if there's a resurrection for Christ, then there's the possibility of a resurrection for us. Now, these Corinthians believed in Christ's resurrection. If you look at verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, uh, uh, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you believed. So they had received the gospel. They had believed the gospel. Well, what was that gospel? Look at verses 3 and 4. It says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So they'd heard the gospel, they had believed the gospel, they had received that of the resurrection. And verse 11 says, Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. So they believed in the resurrection. Their confusion came, well, what about our own resurrection? Is there such thing as a real resurrection? He says, how could they logically deny the resurrection when they believe the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead? It was obviously possible. So if you believe today that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then you also logically believe that there must be a resurrection. And in verses 13 through 19 here, Paul demonstrates that if the resurrection did not happen, if it was not possible, If it was not essential, there'd be seven disastrous consequences that would result. The first consequence of no resurrection would be that Christ would not be risen. Christ could not be risen if there is no resurrection from the dead. Verse 13 says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So Christ could not have been raised if there is no resurrection. If the dead can't rise, then Christ could not have risen either. But turn over with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. John has just seen the vision of Christ, and he declares that he's the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. And this is what we read in Revelation chapter 1, beginning with verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, and this is what he said, Do not be afraid, I am the first And the last, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. So Jesus' own testimony gave credence to the fact that he had risen from the dead. So that would be the first consequence. If there is no resurrection, then he could not have risen from the dead. The second consequence of no resurrection is the preaching of the gospel would be meaningless. Any preaching either by the apostles or the prophets or by Jesus or any preachers or teachers today, would be meaningless if there is no resurrection. Look at verse 14. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is empty. You see in verses 3 and 4 that they had received the message that Paul had given, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. They believed in it. But without the resurrection... There would be no gospel to preach. There would be no death, no burial, no resurrection. Without the resurrection, Jesus Christ could not have conquered sin. He could not have conquered death, and he could not have conquered hell. Without the resurrection, there'd be no life 
life-giving or worth preaching. So no life-giving message, no, no hope of a message. There, our message would be meaningless if there's no resurrection. The third consequence of no resurrection is that faith in Christ would be worthless. No, not only would our preaching be meaningless, but our faith would be worthless. Again, verse 14 says, not only is your preaching empty, but your faith is also empty. Faith in Jesus Christ would be worthless. The word worthless here is the word vain. It means empty or fruitless or void of any effect or, or any purpose or power. Now stop and think about your own faith. If there is no resurrection, then your faith is empty. Your faith is fruitless. Your faith has no object of any affection. It has no effect. It has no purpose. A dead Savior cannot give life. And if Christ is not raised, then we will not raise. And we cannot be raised to newness of life and walk in newness of life, not only in this life, but in the new heaven and new earth. The Hall of Faith in Hebrews 13, do you remember that passage? It's an entire chapter of scores of listing of people of faith. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. By faith, Sarah. And you can go right through that list. But that would no longer be the Hall of the Faithful. It would be the Hall of the Foolish. They would have been faithful for nothing. And all of us as believers would have believed for nothing. We would have lived for nothing. We would have died for nothing. Everyone that, that has come on before us ever since Christ rose, all the generations after generation of Christians and churches, and how about us today? Are you believing for nothing? Are you living for nothing? Are you going to die for nothing? The fourth consequence of no resurrection is all witnessing and all preaching of the resurrection. Everyone who ever preached it would be a liar, including me. Look at verse 15. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. So they, these teachers that we've had for generation after generation would have been false witnesses. They would have been false teachers. Our current teachers and preachers of the resurrection would be false teachers, all willfully mistaken. And if the apostles and the prophets and the writers of scriptures lied about the resurrection, which is the most important doctrine we have in all the scripture, why should we believe anything else that they've written to us? That same witness is what they testified of. They preached and they taught. And because of that witness and because of that testimony, because of that teaching, they were maligned they were beaten, they were imprisoned, and many of them became martyrs. I don't think they would do that for a lie. And worst of all, Jesus himself would be the biggest lunatic and liar the world has ever known. He would have been tragically mistaken about who he was. So up to now, we have seen the theological consequences of no resurrection. But there will also be personal consequences of no resurrection. So that brings us to the fifth, and the rest here are personal. The fifth consequence of no resurrection is that all people would still be dead in their sins, including us. Look at verse 17, it says, And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. So without the resurrection, believers would be no better off than unbelievers. There'd be no point to our Christian faith, because we wouldn't have the forgiveness of sins like everyone else. They too would die in their sins. And after death, we would remain dead and be damned with the rest of the world. If Christ is not raised, then his death was in vain. If Christ is not raised, then our faith in him is in vain. And if Christ is not raised, then our sins are still counted against us and we would be found guilty rather than free before God. The sixth consequence of no resurrection is that all believers who have died in Christ would be eternally perished. They would have eternally perished. So all would have eternally perished. All of those who have the hope to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, they would have perished rather than go into eternity with Christ. 
Look at verse 18. It says, Then also those who have fallen asleep or those who have died in Christ have perished. That's all there is. You live and then you die. That's the end of it. Every Christian who has gone on before us would have perished in their sin. And all death would not have ushered us into the presence of God, but into eternity without God, into eternity without hope. We'd be in torment. They would be in torment. We would be without God. They will be without God. They would be without hope as we would be without hope. So their faith would have been in vain. Their sins would still be unforgiven. And their destiny would still be eternal damnation. So the seventh and final consequence of no resurrection is that Christians would be the most pitiful people on earth. The most pitiful people on the face of the earth, if there is no resurrection, would be those of us who were duped into believing that there was a resurrection. Look at verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are of all men most to be pitied. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, then there is no hope for the next life. If Christ is not raised, then we have no hope of anything beyond our own life right now. We might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die and there's nothing beyond death. If that's true, then for all these generations after generations, we're to be the most pitied people on the face of the earth for believing the lie. Our lives would have been pointless. They would have been without worth or value. Now we would have been taught, we would have preached, we would have suffered, we would have sacrificed and worked entirely for nothing. And all of those believers before us, the same would be true. They would have taught for nothing, they would have preached for nothing, they would have sacrificed for nothing, they would have worked for nothing. If Jesus Christ is not raised, then Jesus Christ can't help us. He can't improve my life either today or tomorrow. He can't be our source of peace. He can't be our source of life and satisfaction. The Christian life without the resurrection is a mocking. It is a futile exercise. It is nothing but a joke. But all of these consequences are not true because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Look at verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have died and fallen asleep. Someone has died before we have died. Someone has gone before us. And John 14 says he's preparing a place for us. And if he goes to prepare a place for us, he will come again and receive us unto himself. Why? Because he was the first fruits. He was the first one to be resurrected. Because Christ was risen, then resurrection from the dead is possible. He was the first fruit, the first one to experience it, and the first one that did it and promised it to us. So we've seen seven disastrous consequences of Christ if He's not risen, if there is no resurrection. But the reality is we need to turn all of these consequences, these disastrous things around, because we have wonderful consequences because of the truth of the resurrection. Number one, Christ is risen. And because He is risen, we have the hope of our own resurrection. Second, the preaching of the gospel is meaningful. It changes lives. It has changed lives for thousands of years. It continues to change lives, and it will continue to change lives until He comes again or we're resurrected together with Him. Third, faith in Christ has worth. It has value. We believe in that which brings worth and value to our lives. And number four, all witnesses and preachers of the resurrection are telling the truth. I want to tell you, I'm telling you the truth. If there is no resurrection, I've been a liar. All the preachers before me have been liars. But because of the resurrection, all witnesses and preachers are telling the truth. Fifth, all people, all believers, those in Christ, are no longer in their sins. There's no more condemnation. We have new life. We have an exchanged life. No more will we ever stand before God and give an account of our sin because it's been buried with Him, raised with Him, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. His blood has cleansed our sins. So we are without sin in Christ because of the resurrection. Number six, all who have died in Christ would have eternal life. We have life after this life because of the resurrection. 
1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, This is the record, this is the testimony that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And finally, Christians are to be the least pitied people on the face of the earth. You know who's going to be the most pitiful people? Those who end up in eternity without God, and without hope, realizing that they had the message in front of them, but they rejected it. But see, we have had the truth, and that truth has set us free. Let's bow together. Father, I want to thank you that we do not face our Waterloo. We do not face defeat. But rather, we face victory because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He has conquered sin. He has conquered death. He has conquered the grave. And He's given us a sense of hope, not only in this life, but in the life which is to come. Father, You are risen. Our preaching of the gospel is meaningful because of Your resurrection. Our faith in Christ has worth and meaning and value, as as do all of our churches that preach the gospel, that preach Jesus Christ, and those who come to believe it and receive it. And all the preachers and all those who have given testimony over the years, they've been telling us the truth. And I want to thank you that you brought us to the truth, and that truth can set us free. That, Father, we're no longer in our sin because of the resurrection. That we have eternal life because of the resurrection. And we are the most honored people in the face of the earth. So, Lord, I pray that this message in the time of crisis, when, in the time of, of difficulty and things that are going on in our lives right now, that, Father, it would draw us together around that common person of Jesus Christ, and it will give us a sense of hope of the resurrection, and because of that hope, that we would have hope to pass on and give to other people. So, Lord, again, we acknowledge you. We'd ask that you would direct our path and direct us to the Savior Direct us, as we talked about last week, to the pivot point of the resurrection, that it might transform and change our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So
bless you and have a great week, everybody.